Does anybody know who's in the picture up on the board right now? Is it what, sorry? The dude that goes into space. It's the dude that went into space, yes. Chris Hadfield? You guys know who Chris Hadfield is? The first Canadian commander of the International Space Station? Chris Hadfield was the commander of the International Space Station a few years ago, and he did wonders for bringing space to the masses. He embraced social media. He took pictures of the Earth, various parts of the Earth, and put them on Facebook and put them on Twitter and Instagram. He took pictures and videos of things that happened in space, um, demonstrated how to do things, how this would react in space versus how it would react in water. He answered people's questions on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram. He communicated via video link to classrooms. He did wonders for bringing space to us, to everyday people. I used to follow him on Twitter, and one day I remember he tweeted this photo right here. This is a photo of himself with a drop of water in front of him. And two things struck me about this drop of water, this picture. One was the shape of this drop of water. A drop of water, this is, this is almost completely spherical, right? A drop of water is typically teardrop shaped. Why the difference? Why in space is it spherical? Why on Earth is it more teardrop shaped? Yeah, because gravity is pulling down on the water droplet here, which causes the bottom of it to be fatter than the top of it. Here, there's no gravity, uh, which causes it to be essentially uniformly spherically shaped. Okay, that's the first thing that struck me. That doesn't have anything to do with refraction or optics. It was just an observation that I made. The other thing does have to do with what we're doing in physics right now, and that is refraction and optics. Okay, the image of Chris Hadfield behind this water droplet, it's kind of weird, right? You look at his face, the whole picture of his face, and his ears are there, his hair is there, his chin is there, whatever, but look inside the water droplet. He's upside down and smaller. You can see most of his face inside this water droplet, both eyes and his nose upside down in this water droplet. This water droplet is acting as a lens. Lenses are pieces of glass or plastic or some other material that refract light in a certain way to produce a certain image, that make us see an image that looks, in many cases, different than what the object actually looks like. Chris Hadfield is the object here. The image that we see is of Chris Hadfield, but the image is different than the object. This water droplet is essentially the same thing as a converging or convex lens. A converging or convex lens is like a magnifying glass. It is thicker in the middle than it is at the edges. It causes rays of light to come together. Hence, we call it converging. Rays of light converge. Versus a diverging lens, or otherwise known as a concave, concave caved in in the middle, thinner in the middle than it is at the edges. We call it diverging as well because the rays of light that go through this one don't converge or come together, rather they diverge. I have glasses on right now. Parker has glasses on right now. Parker, you're, far, you're nearsighted, I assume. Let me look at your face for a second. Head up. You, you can't see far. I can tell by looking at your glasses, actually, okay, by the shape of your face behind your glasses that you can't see far, you're nearsighted, which means you're myopic. Myopia is the ability to see nearby, but not to see far away. If you need reading glasses, then you're hyperoptic, which means that you can see near, so you can see far, but you can't see near. If you're myopic, like Parker and I, the rays of light that are going through the lens of my eye converge, it's a converging lens of my eye. Look, the lens of my eye is a converging lens like we have up here. But they converge together in front of the retina. They're supposed to converge on the retina. That's how we see a focused image is when they converge on the retina. They converge in front of the retina. So Parker and I have to have diverging lenses to spread the light apart before it enters the lens of our eye to kind of compensate for that or correct for the 
deficiency in the lens of her eye. Now, if you need reading glasses, and most young people don't need reading glasses, that's fairly rare among young people. As you get to be my age, you tend to start needing reading glasses more often. Next few years, I will need, I'll need bifocals because I already am myopic. I will also be hyperopic soon. In fact, I can t I, it's already starting to happen. Sometimes I have to take my glasses off in order to see close up. Um, if you need reading glasses, it's because the rays of light that are coming in through the lens of your eye are converging not in front of your retina like they are if you're myopic, rather they're converging back here behind your eye, which means now you need an additional converging lens to cause the rays of light to come together a little bit before they enter the lens of your eye. So myopic, which is, this is the way I always remember this, a myopic is my vision. Okay? My vision is I can see things nearby. I can't see things far away. My vision requires me to have diverging lenses. My vision requires the light to be spread apart before it enters my eye. The other kind is called hyperopic. You don't need to remember those terms, but hyperopic, which means the rays converge behind, okay, which means I need a converging lens in front of my eye to cause them to converge a little bit closer. So myopic is my vision. Hyperopic is the other vision, the vision that is coming soon for me. Now, today what we're going to do is spend some time determining what the image should look like. You can see in this picture here that Chris Hadfield's face is upside down and smaller. Sometimes it will be upside down and smaller. Sometimes it's going to be right side up. Sometimes it's going to be bigger. It depends upon what type of lens you have, whether it's converging or diverging, and it also depends upon where you place the object, where Chris Hadfield, the object is relative to the lens or the drop of water. Everybody can see the picture up on the board right now. This is the same as the first diagram you see on the handout that you just got. This is a diagram of a converging or convex lens. Be prepared for either name, although typically I will call it converging. Be prepared to see convex, though. They mean exactly the same thing. Converging lens, convex lens. Rays of light converge. Rays of light come together. We're going to define a few parts of this diagram here now. Firstly, this little spot right here. We're going to call this the optical center. The optical center of the lens. The optical center is literally the geometric center of this lens. We're going to call, call this line right here the principal axis. The principal axis is an imaginary line that goes perpendicular to the lens and straight through the middle. This spot right here is going to be called the focal point. We'll abbreviate that as F. That's the point you saw in the demonstration a few minutes ago where rays that are parallel will come together. Parallel rays converge at the focal point. And this one, we're just going to call this 2F. This doesn't really have any big significance other than it's twice the distance from the lens as the focal point is. You can see that if the focal point is this far from the lens, then 2F is twice as far from the lens. We're going to use that as a spacer in a few minutes as we're drawing diagrams. Now, on the other side, I'm going to label this F in quotation marks and 2F in quotation marks only because, I'm only labeling them because I need them as spacers. The focal point is not really on the left-hand side, and that's why I'm putting it in quotation marks. It's the same distance as F, but it's not really the focal point. This object, this, this uh, arrow over here, is going to represent our object. And the object could be anything. It could be, well, in the case of the demonstration I did a few minutes ago, the big Canada flag. The object could be, well, for me right now, I'm looking at Parker. So Parker is the object. 
and you do your lab on Monday, you focus on the flagpole on the other side of the football field, the object would be the flagpole, or the condos across the street, the object would be the condos. The object could be anything. The object that you're going to use for most of your lab on Monday is actually going to be a lit candle. The reason we're going to use a lit candle for most of the lab is because that object generates its own light, and we don't have to have the lights on in order to see it. There's no ambient light to kind of wash out the image that we're trying to see. It could be anything. Let's say today that this object is going to be Mr. Gay. And it's going to be, you guys know that Mr. Gay's head's a little shiny. Okay. Certain places more than others, but. So this is Mr. Gay with his shiny head. We're going to draw two rays of light reflecting off of him. There are millions of rays of light that are reflecting off of him, just like there were millions of rays of light reflecting off of the fish in yesterday's drawing. There are millions of rays of light reflecting off of Mr. Gay. Yesterday we drew one ray that was reflecting off of the fish. Today we're going to draw two rays reflecting off of our rice principle. The first ray that we're going to draw is the ray that reflects off of his head parallel to the principal axis. There's one that reflects like this, one that reflects like this, and like this. I don't care about those ones. There's millions of rays reflecting off of them. We're going to draw this one, the one that reflects off of his shiny head, parallel to the principal axis. We're going to draw that to the center of the lens, and then we're going to refract it down here to the focal point. Rays of light that are parallel will converge at the focal point. This ray that we just drew is parallel to the principal axis. The principal axis went through there, then this ray has to converge with the principal axis at the focal point. Rays that are parallel to the principal axis will always go through the focal point. That's why we picked this one, because it was easy. We need two rays, any two rays really. This one was easy, so we picked this one. Next ray that we're going to choose to draw is the one that reflects off from Mr. Gay's shiny head and goes through the optical center. It goes straight through. Now, I've got to own up to something here before we go any further. I kind of lied a little bit. The first ray doesn't really go to this point and then bend. The first ray goes to this point bends, and then this point, and then bends again. Right? There's two refractions taking place there, right? As it enters the glass and as it leaves the glass. The same thing down here. But you know what? The end result is the same, and it's easier to draw it this way, so this is the way we're going to draw it. It's easier to draw one bend as opposed to two, and we get the same result. Okay, what does the image look like? Well, Mr. Gay's feet are right here. Mr. Gay's feet are right here at the, um, at the bottom of the arrow at the principal axis for the object, the real Mr. Gay. The image is formed of Mr. Gay's feet right here at the principal axis. Mr. Gay's head is up here where the rays start. Mr. Gay's head in the image is down here where the rays come together. So what would our vice principle look like in the image through this lens? There's three characteristics or attributes that describe this image. Number one, we describe the size. Is the image of Mr. Gay, look at my fingers here, is the image of Mr. Gay larger, smaller, or is it the same size as the object? Here's the object. Here's the image. The image is smaller. The image is smaller than the object. So this is like in the Chris Hadfield picture you saw a few minutes ago. The image is smaller. Now, the next thing we talk about is the orientation, which means right side up or is it upside down? The image here is, well, how does it compare to the object? It's upside down, isn't it? Somebody told me that a few minutes ago. The image is upside down. We're going to call that inverted Although, really, whatever you want to call it, as long as it means upside down, is fine. And 
And finally, this one's not going to make a whole lot of sense to you yet, but just trust me on this for a few minutes. This is what we call a real image. A real image is an image that can be projected onto a screen. It doesn't mean it has to be, but it can be. In the demonstration that I did a few minutes ago, I projected the image of the Canada flag onto a piece of cardboard, white piece of cardboard. That was a real image because I projected it onto a screen. If I had taken the cardboard away, it wouldn't have been projected onto a screen. But we still call it a real image because I could project it onto a screen. A real image is an image that can be projected onto a screen. Now, you guys probably didn't notice this because of where you were sitting. But when I did the demonstration, I could look through the lens and still see the image through the lens. I didn't need to project it onto a screen. I could look through the lens to see the image. I just could project it onto a screen. Here, Nicole, take a look at this. Hold this and move it wherever you need to move it. Can you see the image there through the lens? Yeah. yeah. So we still call it a real image, even though Nicole isn't projecting the image onto a screen. We call it a real image because she could project it onto a screen if I put a screen right here in the right place. Make sense? Now, thank you. Now, how do we determine that this is a real image? We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Right now, just trust me, this is a real image. If I want to put it on the screen, I can only if I want to. This object, by the way, we're going to say this object distance, d subscript o, is greater than, greater than 2f. So if you take the focal length, double it, my object distance is bigger than that. How much bigger? It doesn't matter. It's bigger than that. It produces an image that's smaller, inverted, and real. Next time, I'm going to say my object distance is exactly equal to 2f. Not bigger than 2f, but equal to 2f. And we move our beloved vice principal a little closer to the lens. We take a look at the rays of light that are shining and reflecting off of him, specifically two of them that are reflecting off of the top of his head. First one parallel to the principal axis, down through the focal point. Second one goes down through the optical center. These two rays of light should converge right here, right below 2F. And the image that's formed here is, how does that image size compare to the object size? Take a look at the size of that red arrow compared to the black arrow. Yeah, same size. Is it right side up or upside down? I think pretty clearly it's upside down, right? It's inverted. And real or virtual, trust me on this one for now. In just a couple of minutes, you're going to see how to distinguish between real and not real. But trust me for now, this is real. If I wanted to project this onto a screen, I could. don't have to. I could stand right here, look into the lens, and see an image of Mr. Gay through this lens that is the same size as Mr. Gay really is, but is upside down. This time, we're going to say that DO is greater than F, but DO is less than 2F. This is the real F over here. This is the real 2F over here, but spacing. It's greater than F, smaller than 2F. First ray. First ray is from top of Mr. Gay's shiny head. Parallel to the principal axis. Where does it go? This is the third time we've seen this now. Where does it go? Down through the focal point. Good. Second ray goes down toward the optical center. Where does it go from there? Straight through. Yeah. Where is the image formed now? Right over here. What are the characteristics or the attributes of this image? Is this image larger, smaller, or is it the same size as the object? 
larger. It's bigger. They've just magnified it. Is it right side up or upside down? What is it, Mateo? Yeah, it's upside down. You could say upside down. You can say inverted. Anything that means the same thing there. Uh, and we're going to say once again that it's real. Just trust me on that. If I wanted to project this onto a screen, I could. Yep. No, it's not. First three have been, though. Right? I'm starting to see a pattern for me here. We started with smaller, inverted, and real. Same size, inverted, real. Larger, inverted, real. What do you think the next one's going to be? Like, before we draw it, I want you to predict what the next one's going to look like. Smaller, inverted, real. Same size, inverted, real. Bigger, inverted, real. What's the next one going to be? Much bigger, inverted, real. That seems logical, right? It is a trap. The next one is what I call the kaboom diagram. Kaboom. Why do I call it the kaboom diagram? Because we got this pattern forming, smaller inverted real, same size inverted real, bigger inverted real, and all of a sudden the pattern goes kaboom. We blow everything up here in the next one. This time we're going to say our object is at the focal point. First ray of light, reflecting off Mr. Gay's shiny head, parallel to the principal axis, down through the focal point. Second ray of light from the top of Mr. Gay's head down through the optical center, down like this. They don't converge on this side, so let's extend them back here. It's dotted lines. They don't converge either. So what can we say about this? There is no image formed. There is no image. That doesn't mean light doesn't go through. If I was to put a screen right here, you would see light on that screen. You just wouldn't see a picture on the screen because the light wouldn't be focused. There is literally no way to produce a focused image when the object is at the focal point. doesn't matter what you do. You can look into the lens. You can put a screen there. It doesn't matter. There is no image. So we've just blown this whole thing up. The next one, the last one, completely different. We went from smaller, um, inverted real, same size inverted real, larger inverted real, kaboom, blow everything up, no image. The pattern changes completely now. Last one. This time we're going to say DO is smaller than F. Here's our object, which Mr. Gay, his shiny head, reflects a ray of light parallel to the principal axis, and then it goes down through the focal point, and then the next one goes down through the optical center. Those don't converge either, do they? Yeah, they go further apart. That's right. But if we extend them back like this, they come together back here. So what would we say about the attributes of the characteristics of this one? Is that image bigger, smaller, same size? It's bigger. It's bigger than the object is. You can say larger. You can say bigger. I don't care. Magnified. Whatever. Number two, we'd say, is it right side up or upside down? It's right side up. Compared to the object, it's right side up. And number three, let's see if you can get this one. This one is not real. We call it virtual if it's not real. It means it cannot be projected onto a screen. If you have a real object, real image, you can project it onto a screen, but you don't have to. You can look through the lens to see it as well. If you have a virtual image, then you must look through the lens to see it. There's no way, there's no other way to view the image rather than to look through the lens. Now, a couple things. Firstly, let's talk about that real image versus virtual image for a second. We know the difference between the two types of images. 
how do we distinguish between a real image on this diagram and a virtual image on this diagram? What tells us, what indicates that this one cannot be projected onto a screen and this one can? Yep. 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 When these solid lines intersect, it will be real. That means we can be projecting it onto a screen. When dotted lines intersect, that means it cannot be real. We cannot project it onto a screen. So it's not virtual because of dotted lines, but the dotted lines indicate that it's virtual. It's not real because of solid lines, but the solid lines indicate that it's real and that it can be projected onto a screen. Now, the other thing is, I want to take a look at a couple of these diagrams and try to identify where this would apply to your, well, pretty much everyday life. Where have you seen this apply? Where have every single one of you used this before? You've got a lens that is close to the object. Here's my object. If the lens is pretty close to the object. If the focal length is 10 centimeters, the lens is closer than that to the object. You produce an image that's bigger, it's right side up, and it's virtual. What is it? It's a magnifying glass. When you use a magnifying glass, right, you know that we're, like right now, I'm looking at Austin through this magnifying glass, and he's upside down and smaller. But yet, when I put it close by this piece of paper, about five centimeters away from this piece of paper, the image is bigger, and it's, upside, it's right side up, and it's virtual. I'm looking through the lens in order to see it. This is a magnifying glass. As compared to this one, where do you see this one every day? Well, at least since September. Where would you see a real image an image that can be projected onto a screen that is larger and inverted every day, at least in this class. It's, it's, go ahead. It's literally the image that you're looking at right now on the smart board, right? But wait a second, it's not upside down. It's, it's real because it's on a screen, right? It's real because it's on a screen. It's, it's bigger, definitely, than the object that's inside of that projector, right? But it's right side up, isn't it? What well, is right side up? But the object is upside down. So it's still flipped. We just make sure our object is upside down. That makes our image right side up. Is that OK? All right, I want to draw one more diagram for you here. One more. And then you're going to draw a few yourself. What kind of lens is this? Con what? This is concave, caved in in the middle. Also known as diverging. Rays of light here diverge as opposed to converge. This is our optical center. This is our principal axis. This is F and 2F. Not F quotation marks, but this is actually F this time. And our other type of lens our focal length appeared on the opposite side as the object, but in this type of lens, the focal point appears on the same side as the object. This is our object way over here. Once again, it's Mr. Gay in a shiny head. First ray, parallel to the principal axis. Where does it go from there? Down like this? Well, that would be a mirror, because it would be re reflecting back down like this. So that doesn't work. How about like this? Does that work? No, because that would be a converging lens. This one actually goes up and diverges away from the focal point. To draw this one, you guys should take your ruler, put the ruler through the dot where F is, and then extend it up like this. The other type of lens, the rays came down, converged. This type of lens, the rays go up and diverge. Hence the name. And we have one more that goes from the top of the object down through the optical center and 
keeps going just like it did on the converging lenses. The image is going to be formed right here, where these two rays converge. The characteristics or their attributes, is that image large or small or same size? It's smaller. Is it right side up or is it inverted? It's right side up. We'll call that upright. Is it real or is it virtual? It's virtual. Dotted line, virtual. What I'd like you to do now is draw the next four ray diagrams where we have the object placed here, where we have the object placed here, here, and here. You will find that it's easier than it was for the converging lenses because for this one, you're always going to get these three characteristics. No matter where the object is, unlike with the diverging, sorry, the converging lens, the image was different depending upon where the object is. In this case, you're going to get the image, the same characteristics and the same attributes, no matter where the object is. So finish up that sheet with the diagrams, the last four. And then after that, if you wish to get a head start on practice question set number 22, you can feel free to do that. That's due tomorrow as well.